Okay, um, so this is my uh, first time at this, uh, this series of workshops. Um, and so it's very nice to be here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so they, they asked me to talk on uh, this topic of weak values, um, which, which is really a topic, I think, which, which fits in the middle or maybe in, in the intersection of um, quantum foundations and sort of more conventional, what might very broadly be called quantum information science. Um, and so I'm going to get on to them, but um, being myself more or less in this position of being between or in the intersection of these two communities, um, I think I speak the language of both communities, I understand the concerns and the perspectives of both communities. It was frustrating in the, in the uh, discussion we had yesterday how much lack of communication there was between the two uh, about the issue of Bell's inequality. So having the floor, I couldn't resist putting in a, a, a very short presentation uh, on, on, on this issue, which I'm just going to squeeze in before my talk. So I, I, want, to, I want to try to give a, a unified point of view on, on these things to see how both communities are not, uh, I mean, just disagree about what they think are, are important, essentially. So this is, um, this is the, the starting point for all discussions about Bell inequalities. These are the macroscopic phenomena that everyone's talking about. So we have a, actually, do I have a thing? Yeah. Um, right, so we have a, uh, so these are obviously uh, represent light cones. The, we have a source down here. Uh, Alice is over here, and Bob is over here. Uh, Alice chooses this is Bell's notations, different uh, settings, and gets an outcome over here. And the same with Bob uh, with an outcome over there. Okay, and so the, we get these correlations uh, in nature. Now, um, of course, what Einstein hoped uh, was that there would be a local explanation for these phenomena. Uh, and essentially what that means is that, uh, that uh, we may have to introduce extra variables, which I've indicated here, uh, so lambda down here, alpha there, and beta there. And what these red arrows mean, uh, that if you know everything that points towards an outcome, then you'll be able to say what that outcome is. Okay? So if you know the values of these hidden variables, these hidden variables, what the source was, what the setting was, uh, then you'll know what the outcome A was and the similar with outcome B. And so this is a local explanation because all of these arrows are time-like. Okay, Bell's theorem is that this fails for quantum correlations. Okay? Uh, so this notion of locality, which as I said, Bell, caused, Bell fixed on in his later papers, the terminology local causality, that fails. Okay, we can't have an explanation like that. So what are the, what are the alternatives? Um, so Bell's suggestion, uh, and, and many other people's, is that we need to have some sort of non-local causality. And so the, the simplest thing you can imagine it would simply be to add uh, some cause like this, which is space-like, um, in which the setting on Alice's side influences the hidden variables on Bob's side, which then influence the outcome uh, that Bob gets. Now, there was a suggestion yesterday in Jean's talk that this is the only alternative, essentially. Um, but uh, what I want to say is the, the quantum information perspective is simply to forego explanation. Okay, to say we don't, we're not going to come up with any cause or any explanation of these phenomena. Go back to the things we started with, which were the macroscopic events. Okay, um, and we just don't posit that there are causes for these outcomes or an explanation for the outcome. Nevertheless, we keep locality in the sense of local communication, okay? That now these dashed lines mean something different. These dashed lines mean that if I change to something on the, the, the start of the, of the arrow, then I can influence, make an observable influence on the thing at the other end of the arrow, okay? And so all of these arrows are also time-like, okay? I can communicate from Alice and can communicate from herself to herself, right? If she changes her settings, she can change her outcome. If you change something in the source, you can change the outcomes here, etc., etc. So this is a form of locality which obviously still exists in, in quantum mechanics. Um, and so you could call it no signaling or local communication or, or whatever. Um, so I think this is, you know, this is really the two completely different perspectives from the two communities, uh, is that they're seeking different things. One is seeking an explanation um, for correlations, and one is simply saying that, we, well, we just, have correlate, we just have correlations and we still have locality in this much weaker sense. 
So that was all I wanted to say uh, on that on that issue. Okay, the, is that a quick question? No, no, or, or you simply don't give an explanation. Okay. That's, that's the, and, and that's, there's a large community out there which is, there's a, there's a, yeah, so my point is there is a large community out there which is happy with that, with saying, we are happy with this situation. We don't seek explanations, we just, correlations exist, and we're happy with this because there is still a locality structure there, and that will be sufficient for us. So that's, that's what I'm going to... Can, can I just, look, look, explanation is a very complicated philosophical issue. The, the sense of locality we talked about was the locality of a theory, not an explanation of a theory, okay? Yep, but and, and then, can I, no. and the result is that no local theory no, can produce... No, 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 can no produce, because... I'm, I'm sorry, can, no, can I just finish? Well, in a well-defined sense, yeah. which doesn't mention the word explanation, no. and therefore you can't say, don't worry about explanations. There's a sense you can define in which a theory is local or non-local. And then Bell proved that no local theory can produce these predictions. Okay, I would disagree. I would say Bell proved that no locally causal theory produces these predictions. Okay, in the foundations community, locality as local causality is the preferred notion of locality. In the quantum foundations community, locality as local communication is the preferred notion of locality. This is why there's this lack of communication, but lack of, you know, of effective uh, discourse between the community, because locality is used in these very different senses. That. There, certainly, certainly if, you, if, you, if this is the only notion of locality you understand, then you'll never understand Bell, absolutely. And, and I think it's vitally important to understand Bell, and I think that everyone should understand both notions of locality. So I'm not saying that one is preferable or, or one is right and one is wrong, but people need to realise that there are these different notions and that the communities, we, don't, we should not just use the word locality as if everybody knows what that means. It means different people, things to different people. And Bell used the term local causality, and I think if that's what we mean, that's what we should use, and we should not say that theories are just local in that sense. We should say they're locally causal, or they, you know, they respect local communication, and those are different things. Yeah, is it, <laughs> very briefly, Nicola? I just would like to comment on, on the alternative that you mentioned with this hidden influence going faster than light. Yeah, this one going from, uh, from Alice to Bob in this case. I think this is also a natural uh, idea that should be investigated. And uh, actually last year in Malta I presented, but maybe I can remind those that were there and uh, tell those who were not in Malta, that we have a result showing that this kind of influence cannot remain hidden. You cannot just assume that there is something going on on a quantum level that would be hidden to us on the macroscopic level, but yet that this kind of assumption necessarily leads to superluminal communication. Yeah, that, that would, well, like... It, can, you explain why not? Ma can, I, I can actually, I, I think this is getting a bit far from my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we better leave this no, for no, discussion. Thanks. Okay. okay. There are many papers. The paper is in Nature Physics, if you like to read it. Okay. So to get so so I actually talk about what I was invited to talk about. I'm going to go on. Um, so so yeah. So I'm talking to talk about weak values, but of course in this for this uh, for this conference, I'm going to talk about uh, their meaning and particular their their perhaps their uses in quantum foundations. Okay. Oh, so. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm at Griffith University, which is here in Brisbane, Australia, uh, in the Centre for Quantum Dynamics. Okay, so this is uh, the outline. So I'm going to begin by defining weak values, talking about their properties then, uh, their possible role as an ontology, but that's, um, that's, I'll be, that's, so I should say in general, I'll be talking about other people's work mainly here, not my own. So uh, I, uh, there are a lot of things that I don't feel completely uh, comfortable talking about it because I was asked to talk about this topic. I, I, for completeness, I'm going to include them. Uh, and then where this where I am more comfortable talking about um, 
the, the value of weak, uh, <laughs> the, the uses of weak values uh, for exploring uh, what I've called here more conservatively than quantum foundations, uh, fundamental questions in quantum mechanics, uh, just in case anyone quibbles and says that's not really foundations. Uh, but anyway, but there, uh, there are things which are interesting to me and I'll talk about uh, uh, various examples uh, and then get on to the conclusions. Okay, so, so weak values, what are they? So, of course, um, uh, when I prepared this, I was forgetting that, that uh, David was going to be in the audience, so uh, I hope that I don't misrepresent anything uh, here. But this is where it all started in this, in this uh, PRL back in 1988 uh, with the very provocative title of How the Result of a Measurement of a Component of the Spin of a Spin Half Particle Can Turn Out to Be 100. Um, of course, deliberately provocative. Um, now... So, so, okay, so how, how, how indeed, how can it turn out to be 100? Um, so I'm going to, to use a slightly different notation from what they used um, to, to try to make it, uh, to try to explain it as best I can. Uh, and so instead of just talking about a spin half particle, let's think about an arbitrary system observable A, okay? And we're going to assume a probe for that observable. So I'm going to have a... Um, a a particle for my probe, so with this, um, with, with canonical uh, position of momenta, uh, initially in a minimum uncertainty state, uh, and so that only requires three parameters to specify the mean initial momentum of the particle, the mean initial uh, position of the particle, which I'll take to be zero, and its mean initial uncertainty in the momentum, okay? which is going to be large, okay, just so you know what it's going on. Okay, then we assume a von Neumann type interaction between the observable of interest and the position of the particle. Uh, and so a consequence of that is that the, the, the probe receives a kick, a momentum kick when it interacts with the system, uh, and that the change in the momentum is exactly equal to the observable to be, to, to be measured A. Okay. So, of course, what this means is that by measuring the final momentum of the particle, we get information of the probe particle, we get information about the system variable A, uh, and indeed we can define an estimate for the system variable A uh, as simply, you know, this thing where we've actually measured that, and we don't know what P in is, so we have to replace that by the mean P in, okay? And that's obviously the best, the best way we can... We can do that, uh, and then if we look, if we have the system uh, prepared in some initial state, psi in, uh, and you look at the expected value of this estimate, which you get from measuring the probe, okay, so we're not measuring the system directly, we're just measuring the probe, uh, and we say what is the ex expectation value of this uh, function A, this trivial linear function A of the final probe uh, momentum, uh, and of course it comes out to be equal to indeed the expectation value of that observable for the system. So if this was a spin half particle and A was a spin in, in the Z direction, uh, this expectation value of course uh, will come out to be somewhere between minus a half and plus a half uh, and will not be a hundred. Okay, so this does not explain how it can be a hundred but it's a step along the way. Um, okay, so, so uh, what we have to do in order to get this, this bizarre thing uh, is to introduce post-selection. So as well as having an initial state, we have to have a final state. Okay? So what we're going to do is consider a final projective measurement on the system as well as the measurement on the, on the probe. And we're going to then consider the sub-ensemble where the system is found in some particular state, phi, phi f, okay, for the final state for the system. And then consider the same thing which I considered before, the expectation value of this uh, estimate of A from the momentum, uh, sorry, from the probe, probe momentum, right, conditioned on the system having been prepared in state psi in and measured in state phi f at the end. Then what you find in the weak measurement limit, which is the limit that the initial probe momentum uncertainty goes to infinity, uh, you get this expression. Okay, so why, why do I call this a weak measurement limit? Um, well, so it's weak in the sense that, uh, remember that this is, we're, we're estimating the, the A based on the momentum of the probe, uh, and if I start with an initial probe uh, uncertainty in the momentum, which is very, very big, it's going to be very, very hard to measure any shift in that, okay? So I'm going to get very little information um, from measuring the change in the, in the, uh, the probe's momentum if the probe's momentum is initially very, very uncertain. Uh, and similarly, you can actually see that in terms of the back action. If I look at any system operator and say what is the effect of, uh, what, what's the, yeah, how does it change due to the interaction between 
the system and the probe, uh, what you get is a contribution proportional to the initial position of the probe. Uh, and because this is a minimum uncertainty state, in the limit that the probe momentum becomes very uncertain, the probe position becomes very certain. Uh, and so this is, in some sense, a very small quantity, okay, it has very small uncertainty. And so the amount of disturbance to any system operator due to the coupling to the probe is very small. All right. So that's the sense in which it's a weak measurement. Uh, and, and what you get is, uh, is this funny looking expression here is actually the expectation value for, for that estimate of the, uh, for, for the uh, observable A. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just want to stress that this doesn't mean that the, the, these measurements are not magic. They're not measurements which give you information about the system without disturbing it. They're just measurements which give you a very small amount of information together with a very small amount of disturbance. And the amount of disturbance is exactly what you'd expect uh, for the amount of information which you've got. OK, so uh, what's, uh, well, OK, so this, the, the, you see the expression which I got here was the real part of, of this uh, the fraction here. So uh, Aharonoff, Albert, and Weidman called actually the, this, the fraction itself, this complex number, this thing in general is complex. They call that the weak value of A. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to use my preferred terminology, which a which, uh, number of other people use, to just refer to the real part of that fraction uh, as the weak value, um, because that's the thing that you actually get as the estimate. Um, and, okay, so what's the interesting thing about it is that that weak value is not bounded below by the minimum eigenvalue of the observable A and not bounded above by the maximum value of the observable A. Okay, so this is, we cannot say this here. Uh, and in fact, it's very easy to arrange a situation where indeed this weak value uh, can be much, much larger than the maximum observable of A. And so you can get, uh, indeed, you can measure in this sense the component of a spin half particle, component of the spin of a spin half particle, to be, for example, 100. Okay, uh, and and so this was a uh, the experimental proposal. Um, it was done, not precisely like this, but something analogous. It was actually done only a few years later um, by uh, by Hewlett. Um, so so this is all perfectly fine, and there's nothing. This is this is actually completely. Uh, there's nothing, you know, a lot of people didn't understand this, but, but actually it's all pretty straightforward quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah. There are play, there are situations where actually the imaginary part of this does play a role. I mean, the, well, so, but, but it's also the case that I think in the particular case we were considering. Oh, it probably came out to be real. It came out to be real. Yeah. Um, um, I think that was the story that, that we just didn't we didn't have the more. There was a very specific case of measuring spin, you know, of measuring x spin here and z spin there, and uh, and wanting to say wanting to see in what sense one could say in the interval in between they were th they both had determinate values um, because of the way you could retrodict or predict and trying to find some single experiment which would display both of them having values and this number came out real in that case okay um, so I'm not sure whether uh, maybe, I, maybe I should just skip over this, but uh, I, I just want to point out that, yeah, you, you can do all of this without introducing probes specifically. For, so, so people who are in the quantum, communica uh, quantum information community, uh, you can just write down, uh, uh, you know, uh, measurement operators, generalized measurements, non-projective measurements, uh, postulate certain properties that they should have in order to be weak, can, yeah, consider a family of them basically, uh, and, and then you, you get the whole thing coming out under some very, you know, you have to make quite a number of assumptions, but they're all fairly natural. Um, and so there's nothing specific about the, you know, assuming you have a Gaussian probe with a particular sort of coupling, blah, blah, blah. You get exactly the same expression coming out uh, under just some, some natural assumptions that you have, you know, an, an, a, an, a, an a measurement which allows you to estimate A, uh, that it's weak in an appropriate sense, uh, that it's minimally disturbing, um, 
uh, and, and that it's a purity preserving measurement. So under these assumptions, it just pops out. Um, the, the more general, uh, probably don't even need that. So you can also, of course, you can assume, uh, so uh, mixed initial conditions, and you don't have to use a projective measurement as your, you don't have to project on a particular state. For your final measurement, you can do a, uh, this is a positive operated value, uh, well, this is a positive operator, part of a positive operator valued measure. Um, and so, yeah, so you can generalize this expression in, in perfectly sensible ways, uh, and um, you still get uh, all those sorts of results. Okay, so, um, yeah, so what, what sort of, what can we say about these things? Um, so, so one, from by construction, it, it obey, they, these weak values obey um, the property of linearity, that if I have, if operator C is the sum of operators A and B, then the same is true of their weak values, okay, as long as they're, they're post-selected in the same states, of course. Um, there's a property of consistency, uh, which is that if you have the situation of some preparation, uh, so pre-selection and post-selection with some positive operator, uh, and if in, if in that situation a strong or projective measurement of uh, observable A in the middle was guaranteed always to yield a particular answer, little a, uh, then the weak value under a different scheme where you don't do the strong measurement but just do a weak measurement, the weak value would also come out to be A. Okay, so that's sort of what you'd expect, uh, and it does. Um, and then, but then, of course, we have this, this unexpected property of the existence of anomalous weak values. So you can't prove a theorem that, the, that this weak value lies between the minimum and maximum eigenvalues of the observable. Um, and if, if you're wondering, like, just how is this possible at all, um, it, it, it's because the estimation, estimation which you, you do, I guess so here I've done it in the general sort of terms, um, yeah, it, it's that the, 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 the result, when you do maybe going back to this result here, is that when I actually use this formula, it might be more straightforward, okay, this necessarily has numbers which, in the, in the weak limit, has numbers which are not constrained between the eigenvalues of that matrix. Because it's weak, because the coupling is very weak, like it's as if when you get a result, you have to multiply it by a very large amount so that when in the end you take an average, you get the average that you, uh, you want to get. Uh, and I guess I, I sort of stated that more formally here, but I, didn't, I, I think we'll leave that away. Okay, so is this really interesting, uh, the fact that you get these weak values which lie outside the eigenvalue range? Um, you know, isn't this just sort of the crazy sort of stuff that you would expect from quantum mechanics when you do post-selection? I mean, post-selection is such a crazy idea. Uh, I'm not surprised it could give you any damn thing. Um, so, so no, um, because post-selection, when your intermediate measurement was a strong or projective measurement, gives you something sensible, okay? If, if I have an initial state and I do a, a projective measurement intermediately, so then the, the estimates associated with getting result K are simply going to be the eigenvalues of the operator A. Uh, so in that case, if I, if I say what is the value, so it's not really a weak value, uh, but it's a pre- and post-selected value with this strong intermediate measure, uh, it lies between the eigen, you know, it lies, yeah, but in this um, eigenvalue range of, of A. Okay, so it has something to do with weak measurements, I'll give you that. But, but, you know, is it really quantum? I mean, these weak measurements are crazy, they could give you anything. Um, okay, yes, it is, does have something to do with quantum mechanics, okay? So, so it, it relies both on having weak measurements and having quantum mechanics, in the sense that uh, if the observable you're measuring commutes with your final projector or final positive operator, that your post-selection that you're doing, or if the observable you're measuring commutes with the initial state, okay, and these are, so if I have a classical system, of course, everything commutes, everything would be co-diagonal, that's what I mean by a classical system. Um, then, again, you can show that the weak value would lie in the expected range, okay? So to get anything interesting from, a weak, from, from this pre- and post-selection, you have to consider weak measurements and it has to be quantum mechanical in the sense that it relies on non-commutation in, in, a, in a central way. So this is an interesting quantum effect. Uh, interesting, yeah, interesting being quantum and interesting that it, it relies on uh, weak measurements, not projective measurements. It can't be only quantum in the sense that the word suggests it's weird, but in actual, if you think about what 
No right. I mean, since it is a weak measurement, like you said before, you really shouldn't have any a priori strong beliefs about what kind of values you should get. They could be all over the place. So why should you? Why is it weird to get? It's it's it's. I mean, there's a certain point which maybe will come later in this talk in, about taking this seriously ontologically, where I get off the train. But I think the question you just asked can be answered. It's not just, it, w what was striking about it wasn't just that the results were weird or out of the range. H here was the original idea. Suppose that, suppose that we have an interval at the beginning of which we know that, uh, uh, that uh, x spin is plus one and, and at the end of which we know that y spin is, uh, is plus one. Good. And then you have these, and, and then you know that if you had carried out an x spin measurement in the middle, a strong one, you would definitely get plus one. If you had carried out a strong y spin measurement in the middle, you definitely would have gotten plus one. Um, and Yakir was interested in trying to push what that seems to superficially suggest, okay, that in the middle, both of these have determinate values. Um, and was frustrated by the fact that, of course, we couldn't carry out both experiments in the middle because whichever you do first messes up, messes up the other one. So what can we do? Maybe we can try to, maybe we can try to, I I in some kind of a non-disturbing limit, measure the, the component of spin in the, in the um, um, it, you know, halfway between x and y, right, in the, in the diagonal direction between x and y. You carry out one of these weak measurements, what result do you get? 1 over root 2, okay, um, which is just what you expect geometrically, okay. So there was a sort of intriguing consistency here. It wasn't just a matter of you get crazy results because the, the measurement is weak. There was some kind of very beguiling it was, it was in some sense what you wanted, okay? You could convince yourself for a minute, oh yeah, this is showing you what's actually there. <laughs> Both of these have determinate values. Really? You would expect that the, that the value in this direction is one over root two. Wow. That's exactly what you get. That was the first result, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then you say, wow, this is cool, okay? And the, the case where you get 100 is where at the beginning of the interval you have z spin equals plus one. At the end of the interval you have z spin equals very nearly minus one. Okay, so you get this huge component. That's the way it was coming out, okay? So it wasn't just a question of its being weird. There was a kind of, of pretty beguiling internal consistency in the way these things were coming out. And then there was this question, I'm sorry, and, then, and now I'll shut up. <laughs> the, the, how is this happening in the measuring device, okay? This should be, all these big results should be in the tails, okay, of the Gaussians. If you analyze what was going on, there was this bizarre destructive interference in the main body of the Gaussian, and you were producing through post-selections these humps way the hell out in the tails, okay? Exactly at one over root two, or exactly at a hundred when they, so there, was, so there was a pretty kind of internal consistency there. This tempts you to take it ontologically seriously. I don't think that works out. But it isn't just that they were crazy results. There was some kind of story you could tell yourself about what was going on. Yeah, I, I think that that's a point. I mean, I think I think I don't think the int the the you know these this ano anomalous weak values. I don't think this in itself makes it you know an incredibly interesting topic. Uh, but the fact that this is possible uh, allows the allows you to get some bizarrely but still consistent sounding sort of stories uh, out of the weak values. And I think that's their value really. That's their their use. Okay. Uh, yes, I did that slide. Um, Okay, so I'm going to, uh, so some people, so Weidman in particular hates this terminology, but I'm going to use it anyway, um, of, of that when you make a weak measurement of a projector, because a strong measurement of a projector, of course, is just a probability, okay? Uh, so I'm going to call this a weak probability, okay? When you, when you make a, a weak measurement of a projector, uh, pi b, um, that's, that's what I'll call that. And moreover, I'm going to say when, when I have uh, post-selection, I'm making a final projective measurement as well, uh, 
that I'm going to define this thing as a weak probability as well. So this is the probability of B and F as being this weak probability of B given this post selection times the probability of getting F for the, for the row in. Uh, and so I'm going to notate it like that. Uh, and I'll also call that a weak probability. And so this thing, of course, is not confined to 0 and 1, the, rate, the range 0 and 1. Um, and, and the nice thing about it is the, this weak, joint weak probability here uh, is that it's actually exactly what's known as the Marginal Hill distribution uh, introduced by them in 1961. And as a consequence, uh, any quadratic function of uh, the, the uh, eigenvalues B and F here, which you calculate using that weak value distribution, agrees with the quantum mechanical uh, uh, expectation value of that quadratic function of the observables themselves. Okay, and this is actually critical to a number of the uses of, um, of weak values, including the experiment that Lee Razima is going to talk about this afternoon. Okay, so yeah, so weak values is an ontology. So uh, the, I mean, uh, I, it seems to me that Aharonov wants them to be some part of the in ontology of the two-time interpretation of quantum mechanics, but I have a lot of difficulty actually understanding uh, what, what his point of view is exactly. So uh, please take that caveat in mind with what I'm going to say here. So roughly, uh, the two-time interpretation of quantum mechanics imagines you have uh, an initial condition for the universe, which of course under Schrodinger's equation evolves to some final uh, state here, which in an Everett world type representation is a superposition of all of these worlds down here. Uh, they imagine that you have a final condition to the universe, which is not that time evolved Schrodinger state, but rather some other state, uh, which corresponds to one leaf in the, in the, the Everett tree, uh, which I'm going to call phi here, uh, although I think I called it, yeah, no, I, yeah, I did call it phi up there, good. Um, and so th th they imagine that by specifying this final state, that essentially what you've done is pruned away all the branches except the one that leads to, to that one here, and you end up with a consistent uh, history of what the universe has done. Um, so that seems to make sense as a story, but, but exactly what is the ontology which is being proposed in this theory? Uh, exactly how, oh sorry, I should have read out the quote, so they say that we show that a special final boundary condition of the universe may be consistently defined as to determine single classical-like measurement outcomes, thus solving the measurement problem. So in, in what sense does this actually determine measurement outcomes? What does the theory actually say? You know, this is how the theory gives measurement outcomes. Well, you read their paper uh, in vain for an answer for that question precisely, uh, but they do in, at one point invoke the notion of weak values, uh, and with a heavily edited sentence, uh, they say the measuring device reads the weak value. It seems to suggest that they're saying that the value for some observable A corresponding to uh, a measuring device uh, is, is the weak value of that, that observable when, you have, when you've taken your initial condition for the universe and involved it forward in time and the final uh, condition and involved it back in time. And that, I think, is probably actually would, would, will work. Okay, will give you uh, presumably, plausibly, uh, classical-like uh, histories for these measurement outcomes. But what about things which aren't measurement devices? What about things which aren't macroscopic, decohered, uh, systems, um, it does the same formula apply. Um, they, don't, they don't actually say, but, uh, but it certainly seems problematic to me to posit weak values in general as an ontology precisely because you have these an anomalous values. You have things that uh, are outside their eigenvalue range. You have you know, probabilities that can be negative or bigger than one. You know, what, what would this actually mean? Exa yeah, no, this is exactly my, that's, this is my next point, okay? That if you posit that this only applies to measurement devices, then, then, however, it's not clear what you're actually gaining from this theory at all. I mean, because then essentially you've introduced the idea that you have macroscopic devices. Um, so so what, what do you gain by actually positing this final condition? Why don't you just posit that collapse happens whenever systems interact with measuring devices? Yeah. That, so, so this is why I, I can't, I'm not the best person to present this, this interpretation clearly, um, but I thought I, I needed to do it for completeness. Okay, so, so getting on then to, to what we, how we can apply weak values uh, in ways that I understand in, in uh, foundational-like questions. Uh, so, so, okay, so first I want to say in general, what, is, what do I think that weak values offer for fundamental questions in quantum mechanics? Um, 
So two main ways. So first of all, that there are many fundamental questions which pop up, which people think to ask, uh, which don't have answers in standard quantum mechanics. Um, but weak values, on the other, other hand, uh, or at least they don't have an, an unambiguous answers in standard quantum mechanics, but weak values often do offer answers. Uh, and so, so in some cases, they could be a completely new answer to the question. In other cases, there might have been many answers which have been proposed already, but the weak values single out uh, one of them. Uh, in either of these cases, you know, obviously you could get some new insight into the problem and it could prompt new research, which is a good thing. Um, uh, even if it doesn't, that uh, at least they often label experiment to be done, which is also a good thing because it brings the issue to the attention of a broader audience. Uh, and here's my theory, here, theory grumble. Um, okay, the other way in which uh, the weak values can be applied um, is that even when you have questions in quantum mechanics which do have an answer, um, that answer might seem to be contrived and not have anything to do with experiment in particular, um, but weak values can show that they actually do closely relate to experiment uh, and, and enable them to be done, which again has the positive outcomes which I mentioned above. Okay, so uh, I think the first, I'm go going to talk about three if I have time, which I don't. Um, so the, the first one I'm going to mention is um, tunneling time, and I really, maybe I should uh, go over this uh, extremely quickly. I mention this because uh, it, this is the first appearance of Ephraim Steinberg, who's been one of the stalwarts in this community. Uh, and so I think this was the first time that he applied this, uh, applying the weak values to, an, uh, to addressing a problem, a question which had been asked before. Um, which is a question of how long does a particle spend under the barrier for a tunneling particle. So, you know, I mean, a lot of people might say, well, that's just a nonsensical question. The quantum mechanics doesn't answer that question. Um, but, but that doesn't stop people trying to answer it, and there have been various answers given. Uh, and what Ephraim showed is that, uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that in a suitable way, if you pre-select on an incident wave and post-select on a transmitted wave, you get a sensible answer uh, for measuring this operator, which weakly measuring this, this operator, which corresponds to the time that the particle spends under the barrier. And it actually corresponds to the dwell time, which was something people had proposed before. And interestingly, in this case, that the absolute value of the complex weak expression uh, comes out to be another time which had been proposed by Boudicca um, on different grounds. So, that was nice. That was nice. Um, okay, I'm gonna, this is going to be much more uh, controversial, I think. Uh, so this is some unpublished work of, of myself and, and the experimental group at, at Griffith Uni. Um, so it relates to explaining Bell non-local correlation. So this really has nothing to do with the, the, the... This is not meant to be a logical segue of the first uh, five minutes of my talk at all. Uh, what I'm doing here is, is starting off uh, from Feynman's explanation of non-local, uh, these non-local, Bell non-local correlations. Uh, so, okay, so uh, everyone's familiar with the CHSH inequality. Um, well, that's not the, the, the expression, rather. Um, so here I'm imagining, so Alice can measure either observable X or Z, these are spin observables, uh, and Bob, P or Q, even though I call them P or Q, they're still just spin observables, so they have results plus or minus one. Um, so in a local hidden variable theory, uh, these the outcomes of these, these measurements are going to be determined by you know, the settings and the hidden variables. So what that means is that there exists a joint distribution over all of those outcomes. And that I could write down the expectation value of this CHS operator uh, as simply the average of this expression here over this joint distribution. And of course you can show that that's necessarily less than or equal to 2, uh, whereas quantum mechanics allows this to be as big as 2 root 2. And that, that's what Bell showed. So what Feynman said in 1991 in a paper simply called Negative Probabilities uh, was that if you don't constrain this probability distribution to lie between 0 and 1, uh, then, if, then you can get uh, this, the CHS expression being bigger than 2. Um, okay, so that, that was a simple observation. Uh, he, Feynman had a thing about negative probabilities. He sort of seemed to like the idea. Um, but he didn't actually say what those negative probabilities would be. And there are infinitely many possibilities even with the constraint that the marginals, uh, so, the, so that if I just look at what could actually be done in one single experiment, if I measure, say, x here, oh, what have I done? Say, a z here and q here, uh, that, that averaging over x and p here would give the quantum mechanical correlations. Even though if I put all those constraints in, I still have infinitely many possibilities for this uh, negative, uh, negative um, or non, non 
yeah, anomalous probability distribution, I should say. Um, okay, but, but what we can do is to make Feynman's proposal definite by actually measuring this probability distribution in a weak sense, uh, and we can do that with weak value. So we can't measure both, you know, X and Z or P and Q because they don't commute, but we can weakly measure Z followed by a measurement of X and weakly measure Q followed by a measurement of P. Uh, and and if, uh, if one does that, uh, then one can actually measure these this probability distribution in a weak sense, precisely the sense that I defined the weak value probability distribution, uh, and this is what we, we saw experimentally. So this is the, uh, the CHSH value, uh, which you see goes above, where, where are we? Uh, right, goes above two, so the green, the green data here. So it goes, goes above two at this point, uh, precisely at the point where the theory predicts that the, uh, that the probabilities go either above one or below zero. And I only plot two probabilities here because it turns out that of all the sets of probabilities, there are only two non-zero ones, and those are the ones which I've, I've plotted, uh, yeah, plotted here, essentially. And so you see the data fits pretty well with the experiment, um, and I'm, I don't have time to go into the detail, but I think, uh, yeah, that's, so this is still uh, unpublished results, um, but yeah, just showing uh, an application of weak values to something which Feynman had proposed. Okay, um, so probably why I was invited was because of some earlier work that I did using weak values in this question of determining particle trajectories. Um, and so, so this is in the context of Bohmian mechanics. If you consider a, uh, so a Bohmian particle, that's all right, called or, or a world particle in the sense that it doesn't have to be just a single particle, it could be any, uh, any size living in configuration space with this equation of motion, okay? This is the Bohmian guidance law. Um, and, but it's been known for a long time that there are, in fact, infinitely many functional expressions for, for the velocity, um, which all of which are empirically adequate in the sense that they, they, uh, they well, they agree with quantum mechanics in that they, they preserve the probability, quantum probability distribution for the particle position, okay? So what I proposed in 2007 uh, is that there would be a way to operationally define the velocity of a particle at position x. So of course, I mean, we can't in quantum mechanics actually just go in and measure the, the velocity of a particle at position x because the velocity does not commute with the position, okay? But what we can do is measure the, the we could weakly measure the velocity or equivalently, what we can do is weakly measure the position at some time and then make a strong measurement of the position immediately afterwards, uh, take the limit when between those two times going to zero, uh, post-select on getting the strong measurement of coming out to be at a particular point, uh, and then this is exactly, this is exactly a weak value. Um, it, so it's the weak value for the position at a slightly earlier time, um, post-selected on the, the position being x, and then you subtract those two things and divide by the time between them. And if one does that, one gets exactly the standard Bohmian expression for the velocity. But, I mean, all the other guidance conditions that you mentioned are going are to yield this same result. Uh, which same result? The, the, the result of, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, that the weak value for the, for the velocity that you measure in this way is going to turn out to be equal to whatever yes. expression yes. you get. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I, have so not I mean, this isn't anything like a, a sort of evidence that one of these no, guidance I'll, conditions is correct and the others well, are false. Well, I'll say, I'll say, no, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that later. But uh, I have not assumed, I should just, so this definition makes no reference to Bohmian mechanics. I want to be very clear about that. This is just, you could know nothing at all about Bohmian mechanics uh, and go into the lab uh, and in fact not know very much at all about quantum mechanics, um, just know enough to, to be able to uh, measure something weakly without disturbing the system very much. And in principle, you could imagine that we could have discovered how to do that uh, you know, through, through experimental practice without knowing anything about quantum mechanics. And you could nevertheless go into the lab and measure a thing like this. Okay. Um, and so this is why, actually, in the paper, I, I say that this, could, this is something that one could measure even as a naive experimentalist. Okay, experimentalist who knows nothing about Bohmian mechanics, in principle this is, nothing about Bohmian mechanics or nothing about, or very little about quantum mechanics. Um, 
But yeah, so so you can do this, and so we're going to hear about this this experiment which was uh, done in 2011. We're going to hear about that this afternoon uh, in the Rosema's talk, um, and and you're going to see this plot. So I'm not going to talk about it very much, except to say that wow, it looks like you you've seen it, bohemian particles traveling in space. Uh, this is this is a, you know this is amazing, um, and it is pretty impressive. But I want to point out that this is not actually following individual bohemian particles. Okay, what this is is this is these are patched together together trajectories by measuring the velocity, the Bohmian velocity at individual points, uh, and then patching them together to make up a trajectory. Okay. So, so we're not, it's not doing the impossible, but it's still doing something pretty interesting, I think. Um, okay, so another thing which I find interesting about this is that I if you work out in general what that expression is for, for some arbitrary Hamiltonian not making any assumptions, uh, this is the expression for the weak velocity. And so you could say, is this always compatible with quantum mechanics? Does this always make the, the, the uh, probability distribution for x equivariant, keep it, keep it equal to the quantum mechanical one? Uh, and the answer is that it does uh, if, and only if, the Hamiltonian is at most quadratic in operators which are canonically conjugate to x, the, the, the configuration. Uh, so you might say, oh, well, okay, well, isn't that limitation of the approach then? It, it only works some of the time. Um, so I'd say, no, actually, that's not a limitation because all physical Hamiltonians are so constrained, okay, to be at most quadratic in the, the conjugate variables, if we take X to be the configuration operator, which is the usual assumption in, in Bohmian mechanics. So in, in this sense, it is saying that, well, it, that doesn't actually have to be an assumption. If we want consistency, uh, we have to take our hidden variable. We have to take X to be a configuration. We have to take it to be something for which the Hamiltonian has this property, and maybe that explains why uh, this is the fundamental ontology. Okay, so David's question, does this in any way prove that Bohmian mechanics is correct? So absolutely not, okay? This does not prove that Bohmian mechanics is correct. It doesn't prove that this is, you know, the only guidance, that this is the correct guidance equation, if you d even if you did believe Bohmian mechanics or anything like that. Um, but what I'd say is that it, what it shows is that Bohmian mechanics is a self-substantiating theory uh, in the sense that you, Bohmian mechanics tells you that quantum mechanics is correct, in a sense, and quantum mechanics tells you that this is what you would measure by uh, what a naive experimentalist would measure the velocity to be, and that velocity agrees with what Bohmian mechanics says. So it gives you a nice self-consistent story, which I think makes it a very natural theory, and other alternatives don't have that property. Um, okay, so I think I'll skip over the other examples just to, to you get an idea that there are, this is actually quite a big community. There are many experiments which have been done, all of which have, you know, a, a sort of interesting uh, in, in the two fundamental questions. Uh, and in particular, this last one, uh, to, there's a proposal to actually experimentally observe the non-locality of Bohmian mechanics, which would be very interesting. Um, and, but I'll just skip to my conclusion then. So, so uh, okay, so weak values per se are not mysterious. They can be derived uh, simply, and uh, I would argue naturally, within standard quantum theory, uh, just by introducing the ideas of non-projected measurements uh, in a weak limit and post-selection. Um, they can be anomalous in this sense, uh, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean they're arbitrary and crazy. They do follow certain logical principles. Uh, in, in particular, uh, you get weak probabilities, uh, which yeah, which relate to quantum mechanics in this particular way. Um, so I've talked about how Aharonov uh, seems to believe that they play a role in the two-time interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and also they can shed light on other foundational type questions, in particular what I was just talking about, uh, uh, empirically obtaining a unique Bohmian velocity law and singling out the configuration uh, as the unique Bohmian reality. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if, you can, if, if we go back to the double slit that you showed, actually what is measured weakly, it's the momentum. Uh, yeah, that yeah, gives so you a mean velocity field. So there's logically, it's impossible to deduce one type of trajectories or a, or a set of trajectories from velocity field. It's totally mean. You can, you can assume an infinite type of trajectories from a given mean velocity field. That's, uh, that's uh, I think, one comment I wanted to make. The second one, instead, if instead of measuring uh, the momentum weekly, you measure the position weekly, then you will see something very different. You will see actually the type of classical trajectories that do cross 
for this experiment. I and so th this is the question, so maybe you can comment on the comment, but I, I, and the question I wanted to ask then is, um, what do you think weak values are properties of? Is it a property of the system, a property of the probe and the type of weak meter you have, or a property of the interaction between the weak meter and, and, the, and the system? Again, because if we measure the position instead of measuring the momentum weakly, then we will see classical trajectories and not because the mean velocity field will be different. So, okay, so to comment on the comment, I, so this experiment was not done in precisely the way I described. However, I mean, I believe that, that, the, that it's equivalent to having done uh, what I suggested here, which does just involve a weak measurement of position followed by a strong measurement of position. So I think that in fact a weak measurement, doing it this way would give essentially the same sort of result. So I'm not sure what you're getting about, maybe we should talk about that later. In terms of the, the question about what are weak values a property of, um, I think, it, it w well, I mean, I don't, maybe property is it's too low to the term to use for them at all, but, but in the sense that they, you don't need to specify precisely what the probe is or precisely what the interaction is in order to get a weak value, uh, it, they just have to, you know, you, they, they have to, they're, they're measurements which have to be of, have certain properties, and if they do, then they're weak measurements, but you don't need to, be, to go beyond that. Um, I would say that they, it's something that, they're something that relates to the system and not really to the apparatus. 